This program is brought to you by Emory University. Well, ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to this Decalogue Lecture in Law and Religion. It's a great privilege to see all of you here. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us this evening. Uh, my name is John Witte. I serve as director of the Center for the Study of Law and Religion, which is a sponsor of this evening's proceedings. Um, our center is uh, devoted to studying some of the hard questions at the intersection of law, religion, and society, looking at them historically, looking at them Abrahamically, looking at them through policy and theological and jurisprudential calculus. Um, our center uh, draws on the skills of some 90 faculty from around the campus, from some 1,600 scholars from around the world. Uh, we offer uh, specialty courses cross-listed in the law school, graduate school, and theology school, a number of degree programs, clinical internships, a visiting fellows program, a couple of book series, ongoing major research projects, and various public forums, lectures, conferences, uh, and events like this special event this evening. The lecture this evening is the first of a series of five major lectures that we are hosting in this academic year devoted to some of the fundamental questions that are dividing our religious and political and <coughs> cultural communities in America and indeed around the world. The Decalogue Lecture is our distinguished lectureship established 10 years ago by a generous gift from Professor Marion Kuntz and her friends uh, in memory of her late husband, uh, Professor Paul Kuntz, whom some of you know as a beloved professor of philosophy here and a professor with a special interest in the history uh, of the Decalogue or the Ten Commandments, and we've named the lectureship in light of his passion, the Decalogue Lecture. Uh, prior Decalogue lectures that have stood here before our distinguished lecture this evening include Robert Bella from Berkeley, uh, Martin Marty from Chicago, uh, Mark Jordan from Harvard, uh, Chief Justice Lee Ward Sears uh, from the Georgia Supreme Court, uh, our own David Blumenthal, the Jay and Leslie Cohen Professor of Judaic Studies, uh, and most recently, uh, Chief Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs of the United Kingdom. This evening, we have the privilege of welcoming a distinguished scholar and friend and colleague and teacher, Professor Michael J. Broyd, who will serve as our Decalogue Lecturer this year. Uh, professor Broyd is a professor of law here in the law school. He's also a professor in the Institute for Jewish Studies on the campus and a senior fellow in our Center for the Study of Law and Religion. Um, he is, by all accounts, one of the great legal authorities in the Jewish world writ large. Uh, he has a coveted seat uh, on the Bet Din, which is a Jewish law tribunal in New York City that deals with hard questions of Jewish law from a variety of different North American communities. Um, he has appeared in a number of uh, prestigious lectureships and visiting rabbinates uh, throughout the world. Uh, amongst his recent stops have included Iran, uh, Hong Kong, Beijing, uh, Melbourne, Sydney, uh, and many other venues in between. Um, he is the author of some uh, six dozen articles and six important books. Uh, his most recent title, just out, is called Contending with Catastrophe, uh, Jewish Perspectives on 9-11. Uh, and that book is exquisitely argued, uh, but also pristinely timed. And that um, together has made uh, Professor Broyd even more of an international celebrity than he already is. He's been on CNN, he's been on BBC, he's been in a variety of major media around the world. It's probably an act of wisdom on his part and an act of mercy from God uh, that he chose to decline invitations to appear on uh, The Daily Show with Jon Stewart and The Colbert Report uh, with Stephen Colbert. I think the book is more serious and certainly the speaker is more serious. We've had the privilege in our Law and Religion Center uh, over these past 17 years to uh, learn from him, to sit at his feet as he opens the text of his own tradition to us um, has been participating with us actively in a number of major projects on uh, faith, freedom, and the family. Uh, he's been a robust participant at lecterns, at the conference table, uh, at private roundtables, and in his interaction with his colleagues, uh, written voraciously uh, on all of these topics, uh, distilling them into exquisite form in his own books, as well as uh, contributing to anthologies and journal symposia uh, that we have put together around those themes. Um, and the unique, unique feature 
uh, of Professor Broyd is his capacity to be both an insider and an outsider at the same time. On the one hand, a deep halachic lore where he draws the riches of the tradition out, uh, dealing with the hard questions that have confronted the tradition uh, from time immemorial, but also dealing especially with hard issues of how a tradition adapts, changes, innovates, um, develops itself uh, as it confronts new cultural realities, scientific questions, uh, political challenges. Um, that skill is distinctive uh, in the tradition, but what he combines that with is a capacity to bring that insider knowledge in a manner that is understandable to outsiders. People from different confessions, deep, different professions, uh, who can learn the lore of his own tradition in terms that they can understand. And that insider-outsider capacity, that gift that he has, uh, distinct if not unique uh, in my experience, uh, is what we will have the privilege of watching in action this evening as he wrestles with some of the hard questions of bioethics, uh, questions that have confronted the tradition in tragic uh, instances in the past, uh, the Holocaust uh, most notably and tragically, uh, but also questions that have come up in the context of 9-11 and that are right on the frontier as we deal with the hard issues of biotechnology, technology, nanotechnology, uh, and more. It's going to be a privilege to listen to this great man uh, open up this wisdom to us. To have the chance to hear him is always a privilege for me, and I know it will be a privilege for you. Uh, he'll lecture for some 45, 50 minutes, and then uh, we'll take good questions from the floor. And would, I'm a, delighted that you're here, and I hope that you will join me uh, in welcoming to this lectern, the Decalogue lectern, uh, Professor, Rabbi, and friend, Michael J. Broyd. I listen to uh, John's introductions, and I continuously wonder to myself if he means by insider, outsider, just confused. Um, and there's always a fear in insider, outsider lectures that um, you sound not like you're a master of a tradition from two perspectives, but you simply really don't know what you're doing. Um, so I hope to avoid that problem tonight, but ultimately, um, you and not uh, I uh, am the judge of the success of this adventure. I'm going to be speaking today about problems in bioethics, um, looking forward for the next 25 years, but you can't really have a conversation about Jewish bioethics without starting by telling the historical story. And the historical story starts, as the handout says, with the three main methods of assisted reproduction, artificial insemination, surrogate motherhood, and cloning. Because these three cases, which have been well discussed in the last 50 years, allow us to develop principles that project towards the future. And they're telling in important principles that I think will guide us through the six cases that are discussed in the handout. Artificial insemination is really a low-tech activity. It's discussed in the Talmud. Um, since my daughter is here, I won't say more than it hardly needs a turkey baster. Um, it's a relatively low-tech activity. Um, the Talmud understood its possibility, and it was widely discussed by the Jewish law authorities throughout the era. It produces two fundamentally different points of view, but ultimate, uh, ultimately a dominant intellectual conclusion that's very important. Rabbi Moses Feinstein, a Jewish law contemporary who lived in the United States, stakes out a basic view about assisted reproduction, which goes as follows. Paternity follows genetics from a legal perspective, and thus, you're the father of a child if it's your semen that's used in the act of insemination. But moral impropriety, what we'd call in the tradition sin, does not follow genetics. It follows conduct. 
And in the absence of a sexual relationship, there's no adultery associated with artificial insemination. And he's writing um, not some theoretical construct, he's writing a practical conversation that was common in the Jewish tradition post the Holocaust. Men came out of concentration camps sterile or infertile, and they married and wished to have families, or at least appear to have families, or raise children. And the question was, would the Jewish tradition sanction, in the sense of recognize and approve of, artificial insemination um, through donor sperm? And he answers very diligently in many different letters and responsa, yes, and that there's nothing wrong with artificial insemination, even with donor sperm. Paternity is given to the sperm donor, but there's no sinful conduct and there's no impropriety present here at all. This is what I conventionally convey to my law students in my Jewish law class as, um, if there's no fun, there's no sin. You can bank on it. Um, this is itself a very important uh, conclusion, although you'll find contemporary Jewish law authorities who argue with him and who say this is a moral impropriety. In the end, the dominant Jewish law of you, which is going to hold ourselves through many different aspects of assisted reproduction, doesn't look at misplaced paternity, absent inappropriate sexual conduct, as a, a moral or religious wrong, or something that the tradition ought to frown on in any way. The next case that develops is the case of surrogate motherhood. Surrogate motherhood comes in really two different forms, um, but they're both technologically the same. The first is a man is married to a woman who has eggs but no uterus, and they wish to have a child. And the second is a man is married to a woman who has a uterus but no eggs. And here again, the Jewish tradition grapples with the principles, and laying out the principles turns out to be exceptionally important. One school of thought, led by Rabbi Aaron Soloveitchik, the brother of the late Joseph B. Soloveitchik, and himself a well-known halachic authority, argues that Jewish law ought to assign maternity the same way it assigns paternity, which is by looking at genetics. And the mother of a child born through surrogate motherhood is the egg donor, no different than the father um, who's the sperm donor. If it's genetics that create paternity, he argues, it's genetics that create maternity. I in truth, um, when I first encountered this theory as a young man sitting in Rabbi Soloveitchik's Talmud class, um, it didn't strike me as correct. And the first significant piece I wrote as a, when I was much younger and skinnier, um, was an argument that I think has since carried the Jewish law day, arguing that maternity is established in the Jewish tradition through birth, and that the motherhood relationship is not merely a genetic relationship. The motherhood relationship is a maternal one, um, derived from the act of carrying a child to term and giving birth to that child. And in a competition, so to speak, between the egg donor and the birth mother, I think the dominant Jewish law view labels the birth mother as the mother. And it excludes the egg donor from the category of mother under the argument that you can only have one mother, and if you can only have one mother, the birth mother plays a more significant role. I could bore you with the details of a technical Talmudic argument, um, uh, but it would bore you. Um, and it's sufficient to note that I think that there is an almost unrefutable um, Talmudic text that drives this conversation that insists that maternity is established through birth um, and through the act of pregnancy and carrying a child to term. And indeed, if you want to think about it from a purely logical way, independent of a Talmudic text, Consider the hypothetical case of a woman who's born without any ovaries, 
and who gets an ovary transplant from another when she's four or 14. And many years later, she marries and has children. Those children are not genetically hers, but yet I have no doubt that the Jewish tradition, or for that matter, the American legal tradition, would label her the mother of those children as a matter of American law. In truth, Rabbi Bleich, my teacher from Yeshiva University, adds an enormous footnote to this. He says, and I perhaps should state his view first as a matter of respect, but I can't because it doesn't make any sense until you understand my view. He says, well, Broyd's view is very interesting. And maybe that's true, but he has no proof to the proposition that you can only have one mother in Jewish law. Maybe you can have more than one mother, and both sides can be, uh, both the genetic mother and the birth mother should be considered the mother. And in truth, Rabbi Bleich has a text proof from agricultural laws, which in the Jewish tradition sometimes allow plants to have more than one mother and father, if that's the right term. Now, although Rabbi Bleich has a very persuasive textual argument, ultimately I'm not persuaded by it because I think that one can't run to analogize agrarian rules to people. Just like as we'll see throughout this essay, I don't even think issues in human reproduction parallel the rules in animal reproduction even though the biological mechanics are more or less the same, and in plants they're not even more or less the same, but people have a unique status in the legal Jewish tradition and in the legal American tradition that give uh, the assignment of maternity and paternity a unique status. Nonetheless, Rabbi Bleich lays this view out. I'm hard pressed to disprove it, and maybe one should add the possibility that a genetic mother is also the mother in the Jewish tradition. And then we turn to cloning. Now, cloning is, at least for humans, so far theoretical. But you shouldn't think it's theoretical for scientific reasons. Um, they've cloned horses, they've cloned dogs, they've cloned cats, they've cloned mice, they've cloned frogs, they've cloned almost every mammal. To the best of our knowledge, um, they haven't cloned people, not because it's technologically impossible, but because governments have taken steps to restrict the reproductive cloning of people because it violates our sense of secular ethics. First and foremost, I want to voice my Jewish opposition to that. I, I think we're in a Hollywood culture where when people think of cloning, people think of either Star Wars or if you're a little bit older, um, the boys from Brazil, depending on your generation. If you, if you, if you immediately think of Star Wars, and you've never heard of the boys from Brazil, you're of a particular age, and if the boys from Brazil conjure up memories for you, then you're of a different era. And we're opposed to cloning because we think cloning will allow the creation of armies of people that will be used in some way that's dehumanizing. In truth, I think here the Jewish tradition says something very profound. Cloning is a form of assisted reproduction for profoundly infertile people, if you structure it correctly. There are people out there who have no sperm at all, and assisted reproduction won't work because there's nothing to assist. This is not uncommon in a military setting, and it's not uncommon as an indu in industrial accidents. These are painful situations. Um, cloning allows the taking of the genetic material of a man, who's utterly infertile, um, the egg from his wife, um, the insertion of his genetic material in her egg, the implantation of this egg into her, its stimulation into a clone, she will carry the child to term, they will have a child, the child will look astonishingly like him, but you know what? That's not so unusual. Better to have your children look like you than the postman. That's uh, for sure true, um, and nobody will look askance um, at a child that looks just like you, um, and this will allow people to reproduce. The Jewish tradition thinks that while, of course, all reproductive technologies are subject to possible abuse, at the end of the day, reproductive technologies are subject um, to enormous positive use. And by the way, the literature on 
Artificial insemination and surrogate motherhood started out the same way. People said we shouldn't allow artificial insemination because women will look at their husbands and say, you're a nice man, but I'd really rather have children with Albert Einstein's sperm. And men would look at their wives and say, gosh, you're a wonderful wife, but I'd really rather have children using Madonna's eggs or Madame Curie's eggs, again, depending on what you admire. And it turns out, and I admire Hannah Broid, by the way. I just want to note for the record. Um, very much, um, in ways that are hard to express in public. Um, but, um, but it's important uh, to understand that while you can always imagine reproductive technologies being abused, it turns out that everybody who's using artificial insemination is doing so because they have no other choice. Um, the old-fashioned way is uh, cheap and entertaining, going back to my initial comments. And it turns out that assisted reproduction, artificial insemination, surrogate motherhood is something desperate people do to have children that they love. And I have no doubt at all that if we permitted reproductive cloning, the vast number of clones would not come out of Steven Spielberg's films, and they wouldn't come out of people seeking to clone little Hitlers. They would come out of desperate couples looking to have a child that they can call their own, um, in which uh, the woman is in, impregnated with an egg whose genetic material comes from the man, and people don't ask the kind of questions of, well, how did that child get in you? Those are just not the kinds of questions uh, we ask. So first and foremost, I think the Jewish tradition looks at cloning and says the opposition our secular society has to cloning is misplaced. And cloning is a, a positive activity. It produces children. Children are an intrinsic good that our secular society ought to support. The birth mother, I think, is the mother of the clone. The man who contributes genetic material, if it is a man, is the father. The woman who contributes genetic material to a clone is like um, the contributor of an egg in a case of surrogate motherhood, who Rabbi Bleich would label also a mother, and who I would label not. Um, but I think that it's important to recognize that cloning also provides for us a moral paradigm, which is it's too easy to imagine the worst case scenarios in assisted reproduction and be afraid of the future, be against assisted reproduction, be against cloning, be against artificial insemination, because you can craft theoretical opposition to it of the bad things that could occur without looking at the fact that more or less um, good moral traditions, the Jewish tradition particularly, looks up and says, Processes that enable people to have children who otherwise can't are processes that we ought to support. And even if these children are not produced completely naturally, children are produced. And that's a good thing and an activity that we ought to support. And now we can take these three cases and the principles they've generated and look over the horizon to things that maybe at first glance strike us as scary, but where the principles we can adduce allow us to understand that we shouldn't be really scared. Pre-implantation genetic diagnosis is not over the horizon. It's right here in front of us now. There's a lab in Detroit that's doing PGD all the time, and there are a few other labs in the country that are doing it on an experimental basis. Couples go in for pre-implantation genetic diagnosis because one of them, or frequently both of them, have a recessive illness that they want to make sure their children don't have. And they take many eggs from the woman, sperm from the man. They inseminate 32 eggs in different petri dishes. They let them grow to a few cells, typically 32, sometimes 64. They take one cell from this pre-embryo, and they genotype it. And they can tell which of these embryos suffer from the genetic illness that the parents want to avoid. And then they don't implant 
these embryos, and they instead implant in the parents embryos that are healthy. The Jewish tradition looks at that and says, gosh, that's a wonderful thing. That's not problematic. Although it's unnatural, the desire to produce healthy children is a good thing. And even the scary cases of PGD don't really scare the Jewish tradition. For some reason, our secular tradition looks at PGD and says, you know what people are going to do? They create the following scenario. A couple has a child that has leukemia. And the moment you have a small child who has leukemia, one of the things the doctors recommend you do is you try to have another one, because the odds are 1 in 16 that the sibling will be a bone marrow match, and the bone marrow match will maybe save the life of this child. Instead of just having a random child now, you go in for PGD, they do a genetic matching, and they implant the child that you know for sure is the bone marrow match. Newsweek called this a terrible thing many years ago and expressed how sad it is that children will be born to be used. I think the Jewish tradition looks at that form of PGD and says, a double good deed. When you're finished with this activity, you know what you'll have? Two children. The one that has leukemia will live because it'll get a bone marrow plant, it, transplant, and the second child that you had will live a nice, fine, normal life because having bone marrow taken from you doesn't do you any harm at all. The notion that we can design a second child to save the life of the first child at no cost to the second child doesn't strike the Jewish tradition as scary. It strikes the Jewish tradition as rewarding, uplifting, and positive. So even something like PGD, which allows designer babies, is something the Jewish tradition looks at and says, OK. Now, the harder cases of PGD involve parents who want to give their children attributes that make us uncomfortable. Two deaf parents come in and they do PGD, not because they want to have a child who can hear, but because they specifically want to have a child who is deaf like them, who can relate to the world just like they do. So here I think the Jewish tradition speaks pretty clearly. Parents who have a great deal of discretion in how they raise their children do not have the discretion to handicap their children that way. Think about it this way. If these two deaf parents had had a child born who could hear, and they wanted to take this hearing child to the surgeon to make the child deaf, so that it would be deaf like them, we would call Child Protective Services in a heartbeat. And just like you can't make your children deaf, you can't design your children to suffer from this problem. The Jewish tradition does very much recognize the difference between curing an illness and inflicting an illness on your children. And it holds parents to a standard by which they have some discretion, but they're obligated to do what's in the best interest of their children, making them healthier um, and not making them worse off. The human artificial chromosome just continues this conversation. Maybe it's a little bit scarier. The human artificial chromosome takes the genetic material of a man or a woman and sends it through a, genome, a machine that can synthesize, that can first type your genetic material, so it'll give you a coded listing of all of your chromosomes. And then we have a machine that can synthesize your genetic material. We now have fruit flies that have been created through totally artificial chromosomes with no um, fruit fly mommy or fruit fly daddy, if that's the right term. And eventually, we'll be able to do this for people as well. Again, why do you think people will do this? The answer is, is that there are people out there whose genetic material is sufficiently corrupted that it needs to be corrected in order to produce healthier, better children. And in that type of situation, I have no doubt that the Jewish tradition would look at that kind of genetic manipulation and say, oh, this is a curing of illness. This is a fulfilling of our mandate um, to make our children healthy. It's true paternity would be uncertain in such a case, maybe, in fact, the genetic father wouldn't exist at all. But I don't know that that's a centrally important question.
Maybe the centrally important question is, have we produced another healthy child, or at least another healthier child? And that even something as foreign to us as an artificial chromosome wouldn't be problematic at all. And the same thing is true with flat out genetic engineering. Look, genetic engineering is an attempt to introduce traits into people um, that they don't have, sometimes from other human beings, and sometimes from animals. Um, I'll give you just an example, um, and, and I guess this is a way of thinking about it. Can you turn the screen on? This is a bioluminescent cat. Um, we've learned how to take the bioluminescent gene that you've seen on occasion in glowing fish. You can buy glowing fish. Um, uh, they're kind of neat. You turn off the light, you see them swim around. But there's no reason why the bioluminescent gene should only exist in underwater creatures. We have done, through genetic engineering, bioluminescent cats. And if you go on the internet, I'm sure half of you are doing this right now, you can search for bioluminescent mice and pigs and chimpanzees, and there's no reason why we couldn't have bioluminescent children. Here and there, at night, Khan and I have stumbled around looking for the children. Think about how easy it would be if they glowed in the dark. Um, it would make spotting them uh, simple. Uh, uh, on the other hand, Deborah, sitting right over there, she is another glowing child, albeit in a totally different way. Um, but in truth, genetic engineering is a wonderful example. It's a case where we can abuse this technology and do it for entertainment. Do genetic engineering to create bioluminescence. And you look at that and say, well, that's a trivial, almost violation of the sanctity of humanity. Um, no gain, and an enormous amount of tinkering. And so too with other examples that you'll easily see on the internet of um, bioengineering. But the core technology of, bio, of genetic engineering is designed to cure illness. Um, they're trying to do GE to make people more resistant to illnesses. We are, so to speak, no different than the genetically engineered tomatoes that we eat. They're making genetically engineered tomatoes resistant to fungus. You and I would also like to be fungus resistant, I suppose. And certainly, even if fungus resistance isn't important to us, um, AIDS resistance certainly is. Cancer resistance certainly is. There, we know now there's a breast cancer gene. There's no reason to imagine that there won't be a genetic engineering way um, to change um, the breast cancer gene so that it doesn't express itself. Genetic engineering is, in the Jewish tradition, a tool. It's a tool. Like all tools, you encounter people who say, wouldn't it be good if we lived in a world with no hammers? Because if there are no hammers, nobody will get hit by a hammer. But then you close your eyes and say, well, but if we have no hammers, uh, maybe we'll live in a world with no houses. And then you begin to realize a basic position that the Jewish tradition says very repeatedly. Um, the curing of illness is part of our mission on this world. Um, techniques that can be used to cure illnesses are very good things. It's our mandate to explore them and take these techniques and apply them in ways um, that extend human life, save human beings from illness, catastrophe, disaster. And of course, there's a possibility that these same techniques can be used for harm. But that's not an argument against developing cures. That's an argument for regulating against harm. This is, by the way, the way the Jewish tradition looks at stem cell research. Another head scratcher from the Jewish perspective. We don't understand, I don't understand, why the fundamentalist Christian community is opposed to stem cell research. The combination of stem cell research and cloning holds out the possibility of a biological revolution in our lifetime. In the old days when you got ill, they gave you an antibiotic. 
And then starting in the 1960s, if some of your organs got ill, they give you a transplant from another person's organs. But the combination of stem cell research and cloning holds out the possibility that they'll be able to grow body parts for you as you need them. And you shouldn't think this is pie in the sky research. There's a lab out in Stanford that's growing kidneys from stem cells um, for specific people. And you know what happens when you run blood through these kidneys growing on a titanium plate? They drip out urine, just like they're supposed to. We're on the cusp of curing kidney illness this way. And there's no doubt that over time, stem cell research and cloning will be used to cure dozens of other illnesses. People who lose eyeballs will have new eyeballs grown. That's much farther in the future. The most common of male illnesses, the one that John and I both suffer from, male pattern baldness, um, will uh, undoubtedly be cured um, as well. It used to be that I didn't think it was a serious problem, but the older I get, the more uh, serious I, uh, I am about genetic engineering to cure male pattern baldness. Um, but you see that these kinds of technologies, at the end of the day, the Jewish tradition looks at them and says, what you have to do is you have to focus on whether you're using the technology to cure a serious problem. And it's not the technology that's at fault when it's being used in an abusive way. What we need to do is we need to regulate genetic engineering to make sure that it's more or less used in positive ways, to cure illness, to make better people. The fourth is human-human chimerisms. Human-human chimerisms are a way of combining two fetuses in, an in vitro fertilization so that a child has genetic material not just from uh, one fetus, from his mother and his father, but from two fetuses that are combined. This very rarely occurs in nature. Um, and it's sometimes done in um, IVF labs. It's done, by the way, in IVF labs for a reason that's, in the biggest picture, inconsistent with the Jewish tradition, which is it's done in IVF labs as a service to same-sex couples. So I'll have two gay men in a relationship who want to have a child. Only one of them can be the father. They'll find a surrogate mother, however, They'll take two eggs from her. They'll inseminate one of her eggs with his sperm and, one of, and uh, one of her eggs with the other his sperm, and then they'll mush them together, creating a human-human chimerism that's a, a child that has genetic material from both of them. I first encountered this when I was consulted about the Jewish status of a child taken by um, the West Virginia child abuse authorities from two lesbians in a relationship that had created a human-human chimerism. It certainly takes place. But the research on human-human chimerisms is not done for these reasons. It's done in the hope of introducing genetic material into fetuses, into pre-embryos, where the mother and the father are lacking some genetic material. Maybe if the mother is a Tay-Sachs carrier and the father is a Tay-Sachs carrier, and we mix in a little bit of fetal cells from a child that's not a Tay-Sachs carrier, we can produce a child who doesn't suffer from Tay-Sachs. And if you want to get a little bit spookier, you move to human-animal human -animal chimerisms. Human-animal chimerisms occur when you combine the embryos of two different species. Again, just to give you an example, this is a gleep. It's a sheep, goat, chimera. It, take, it, it occurs when you take a, a pre-embryo of a sheep and a pre-embryo of a goat and you mush them together and it produces an aptly named geep, which is something of a hybrid between a sheep and a goat, two species who can't mate, can nonetheless create human, human, animal, animal chimerisms between two species. Now, at first glance, you look at this and you say, wow, that's scary. Why would I do that? What's in it for that? Thank you. Um, 
and you think to yourself, oh, I've been reading too many comic books. We're going to create Spider-Man or Batman or other hybrids. And then when you read the literature, you see, by the way, that 11, 12 years ago in Stanford, this wonderful lab started doing human mice chimerisms. And to everybody's surprise, the human mouse chimerism took hold and it started to grow. Now the FDA, God bless them, absolutely lost their minds and said, you're growing human mouse chimerisms, you must stop. And Stanford said, you can't make us. And the FDA said, oh yes, we absolutely can make you. And they did stop. Um, and, you know, when you first hear this, you say, human mouse chimerisms, are these people sick? What do you want? It's bad enough that we have Spider-Man and Batman. You want Mouse Man, too? But then you read the protocol, and the answer is, no, no, no. They were trying to determine whether mouse insulin receptors can be brought into human beings through this way. Mouse insulin receptors apparently are uh, more sensitive and more powerful, coming from a uh, a family with uh, diabetes, you see that um, insulin receptors become very important. And maybe human-animal chimerisms fall under the exact same paradigm as all other forms of genetic engineering. It's easy to conjure up in a movie something scary. But it's important to revert back to the basic Jewish law norm here, which is we're duty-bound to cure. The Jewish tradition doesn't lay out prohibited cures in all but the rarest and most unusual circumstances. And when somebody says, I have a new technology that can cure children of illnesses, the appropriate response isn't to say, oh, that technology scares us. The appropriate technology, the appropriate answer is to say, saving people's lives is the ultimate mitzvah. It's the ultimate good deed. When people started getting heart valve transplants, and in the beginning, the interim heart valve was from a pig, you heard silly people say, oh, Jews, they don't get pig transplants. But smart people realized that that's nonsense. Um, the mitzvah, the obligation to cure people of illnesses overwhelms any of the other uh, problems at play here. Human-animal chimerisms, if they're used wisely, um, also fulfill the process of producing um, healthy, wonderful, loving, um, illness-free children. And in the end, that's what the Jewish tradition wants us to focus on. And the same thing is true with xenotransplants, perhaps the most scary. Um, perhaps the most scary. Xenotransplants involve the putting of a human fetus in an animal. It raises core questions about what do we mean when we talk about a human being. And it's worth, by the way, reviewing the Jewish tradition here as well. Um, Rabbi Judah the Pious, a medievalist from centuries ago, was asked a question concerning a woman who had given birth to a child that had only one eye and a little bump of a tail and perhaps some sort of scales on his arm. And the mother and father came to Rabbi Judah the pious and said, we want to kill this child because it's a scary little monster. As if all children aren't sometimes scary little monsters. And Rabbi Judah the pious writes a very famous response. He says, you can't. Um, that scary little monster is a human being. And that which comes from a human mother is human. And not only can't you kill it, he said, you need to find somebody to nurse this child and to try to allow it to live. One definition of humanity is that which comes from a human mother is human in the Jewish tradition. And we don't look at mental ability. We don't have any thought process that says retarded children, even profoundly retarded, are not people. And they're entitled to full and complete protections, entitled to every human being. But the Jerusalem Talmud gives us another story, by the way, a mythological story, but one worth repeating. It discusses the question of the rabbi's encounter with the Roman centaurs, half horses, half people. Now, of course, the rabbis didn't really encounter centaurs, um, but they frequently use these stories to teach 
very important moral lessons. So the Jerusalem Talmud asks, is this a man or a horse? And it, asks, it gives a very interesting answer. It says, well, is it pulling a plow or studying Talmud? If it's pulling a plow, the Jerusalem Talmud says, then it seems logical to claim, you know what it is? A horse. And if it's studying Talmud or calculus or maybe even law here or there, um, it's a human being. And the Jerusalem Talmud, not often cited, but it's worth remembering that deep in the Jewish tradition, intelligence is a central characteristic of human rights, and creatures that don't come from humans that exhibit human-like intelligence are governed by the prohibition against thou shalt not kill. So much so, you know, that there's a medieval literature about whether the prohibition of killing applies to trained orangutans or other quasi-human looking species that in the 1800s they saw showed intelligence without discussing exactly how these are resolved. And I think the consensus is against their humanity. What bothered the 18th century rabbis were that they saw trained monkeys and they thought that trained monkeys might just be stupid children, so to speak, and were entitled to some vestige of human rights. And I think when it comes to xenotransplants, the answer is, is that if you put a human fetus in a gorilla, and the gorilla gives birth to a human being, um, and six years later that little human being is playing chess or um, reading, or engaging in other human activity, there's no doubt at all that the Jewish tradition labels that a person, even if perchance its mother um, is not a human being. And it's important to understand even the xenotransplant literature is being driven by a sense of compassion. You might ask, who's doing work in xenotransplants? And although the explanation is complicated, the answer is, is that xenotransplants are being worked on to alleviate the shortage of surrogate mothers. Surrogate mothers are hard to find in this and every other country um, because it's a task that people don't want to do. And xenotransplants might be a way of, of enlarging the pool of people, people, of carriers um, in situations of surrogate motherhood. But I think at the end of the day, the Jewish tradition looks at xenotransplants and says if that which comes out has human function, um, then there's no doubt at all that that which it is is called a human being. So it's worth stepping back and both looking backwards, as the rabbinic tradition does, and looking forwards as well. Reproduction in human beings is first and foremost becoming more choice-driven. Um, and um, these choices allow us to have greater input on what our children will look like if we're so interested. We have the ability to make choices, at least in situations where we're aware of it in advance, um, that rid our children of illness, perhaps add illness if we're bad people. But reproduction is much more choice-driven now than it ever was. Now we not only choose when to have children, we have much greater ability to choose what our children look like. And I think the Jewish tradition puts forward three rules that we can end this lecture on. The first is parental genetic choice must be limited by the best interests of the child. We live in a secular society that wants to assign unfettered choice, but I think the Jewish tradition says genetic engineering, um, human-animal chimerisms, human-human chimerisms, artificial chromosomes, all of these things can be done when you can show us why this is in the best interest of the child that's being produced. It's not for parental entertainment. Bioluminescence in your children is not just a toy parents should have, but genetic engineering to make their children healthier um, would be a blessing. And the second thing is we ought to not be afraid of new technologies. It's a brave new world out there. 
And this brave new world is full of new ways to cure old illnesses. New ways to cure old illnesses is as full a fulfillment of the divine mandate to fix the world as any ancient cure. We need to run to new technologies. The Jewish tradition is not a Luddite tradition, or as one of my teachers used to say, even if we sometimes dress like the Amish, um, we don't act like the Amish in many other ways. We're not interested in living in a Luddite technology. And the third is the recognition that children are a blessing. And processes and technologies that allow the production of children, even if abnormal, even without an act of perfect marital intimacy, even with an artificial chromosome or a little bit of a mouse, or the mixture of two human beings, the production of children is an intrinsic good in this world. And when healthy children are produced, the Jewish tradition says, Mazel Tov. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure having you all here. Well, that was just great. You can see why we love having Michael Broyd with us, and um, now you can engage him in conversation. Another round of applause. So now the fun part starts. Uh, you have a world authority dealing with fundamentally difficult questions with extraordinary acuity. And I would welcome you to put pithy, uh, direct questions, no speeches please, uh, directly to uh, Professor Broyd. Um, there are microphones in the center of the auditorium. If it's difficult for you to get to the microphone, we have a couple rovers that can bring a microphone to you. Um, so we'll just uh, let Professor Broyd take a few when he's getting tired or you're getting tired or we're all getting tired. Uh, I'll come back up and move us to the next phase. So um, I would love to bring you back to the um, traditional surrogacy and the genetical surrogacy and, uh, and your discussion with Rabbi Bleich. Um, I understand that your point of view will be like if the incubator has a mezuzah, the kid is Jewish. Right? I mean, so it's the mother, it's the womb that the mother is hired for, so the kid will be Jewish regardless of the fact of the genetic um, material that the, that the kid is bringing. Yes. Okay, so, so the question is, do you think, I understand that you have a discussion here with Rabbi Bleich, and I understand also that Rabbi, I think that the, in 2005, Rabbi, the former uh, Sephardic chief rabbi of Israel, Rishon Letzi, and Rabbi Yosef, also have the point that the, if the DNA was coming from the mother, that kid could be considered Jewish regardless of the surrogacy of the incubator, right? Rabbi Yosef wrote a letter without any explanation or reason, um, and he didn't write it himself, so it's hard for me to understand what's going on. The written response literature with, with reasons and rationales given um, has very few supporters of the genetic motherhood theory in it. So until somebody produces a more intense, thoughtful um, exposition of the, genetic, of the genetic theory, I'm not inclined to take it more than as a matter of doubt. So the question, the question, my question is, do you think in any near future that you will change uh, that concept of the DNA being part of a Jewish mother so the kid will be Jewish? When you see, when I, at least I see, you know, in daily basis that those uh, mothers who gave their genetic material, even though they were not, they needed to hire surrogacy, uh, they look exactly to their kids, or the kids look exactly like them. Nevertheless, you have to go through the mikveh and the whole process of uh, conversion to the kid. Who knows? I could change my mind, so it's very hard to tell. But I, I don't, uh, my intellectual inclination is where it is now, so I don't know what else to say. I hope you do so. In the, in the case of, let's say, the parents, they have a child with leukemia and they want to, <coughs> want to create another child for a bone marrow transplant and you, you have like 30 or 32 different possibilities and you choose the right one, what is the status of the ones that have not been chosen? What do you do with them? So pre-embryos, I think, have no sanctity in the Jewish tradition, um, even according to those who think that abortion is a grievous uh, sin. And the reason why this is so, and we stand in firm opposition to the Catholic tradition in the United States, 
is because pre-embryos naturally won't grow to human beings because they're out of the woman. So I think the answer is, is that pre-embryos can be discarded in the Jewish tradition, although like all reproductive material with some sanctity, not with the casualness, but um, discarded reproductive material can be discarded. But it does have some sanctity. I mean, discarded is kind of a... It's not a homicide. It's not homicide. It's not homicide. It might be somewhat analogous to birth control, but um, birth control is um, permitted. And particularly birth control designed to increase reproduction is not only permitted, but uh, licensed, sanctioned, encouraged in the Jewish tradition. The Mishnah, which discusses birth control, presupposes that birth control to increase the survivability of one child is 100% permissible. Couples uh, choosing reproductive technologies will often seek gender selection. And is there a uh, Jewish position on gender selection as part of the um, IVF process? No, I don't think the Jewish tradition is either for or against gender selection, although I think it would recognize that society might choose to regulate this because gender selection is one of these cases where each and every one of us acting independently doesn't cause any systemic problem. But if you allow gender imbalances in society, you face enormous social consequences. I would not be opposed to governmental regulation against gender selection if, in fact, gender selection in the United States were shown to favor one gender over another. So far in Israel, which has very active IVF and which does permit gender selection after PGD, it turns out half the people want boys and half the people want girls, in which case gender selection seems to work um, fairly well and it provides a pot for every uh, lid and a lid for every pot. Michael, um, two things. One, just to let folks know, you don't have to go to Chicago. You don't have to go to Israel. You can have PGD here in Atlanta. There are several places, number one. Number two, we'll get back to your analogy, which has always been interesting about the two deaf, the parents who want a deaf child. The deaf community in this country, there's a, a very uh, militant wing of deafness who feel it is absolutely their right. They, they do not see deafness as a disability. They see it as a culture. Uh, they're actually very much opposed to cochlear implants and other things, too. But their feeling is that it would be very difficult for them to raise a normal hearing child. So in some sense, they're right, or they feel it's their right to go ahead and opt for a deaf child. I, I don't just doubt the sincerity opinion. of their view, but I think it's worth saying as follows. Forget about the te this technology. If they had a hearing child, and they wanted to take this child that heard to a surgeon to um, uh, make this child deaf, there's no doubt at all that the law would interfere. I don't favor treating genetic engineering different than any other result-driven technology. What our legal system has to ask, and what I think the Jewish tradition diligently asks, is whether the outcome is an outcome that we would approve of, the process is secondary to me. So I don't doubt that there is a deaf community that's doing this, and I won't doubt their sincerity, but I think we should regulate against it. The world is full of sincere so people. So even if they wanted PGD, where, where they're not causing, they're just selecting a deaf child. You just, you just made the statement that these others are pre-embryos. They don't count, basically. But you would still not allow them that I cause. would not allow the, the selection of a child um, that has what we as a society consider a defect. That's right. I think the Jewish tradition would frown on that. Israel offers free IVF procedures for women under 45, up to two children. And I was wondering how much um, Jewish ethics informs that, or if it's more informed by political reasons. And I ask that because the United States seems averse to funding IVF procedures? Uh, it's very much out of my area of expertise, so I'm always tempted to talk endlessly about matters that I don't know anything about. Um, uh, it comes, I think, with um, smicha. Um, it, it comes with being a member of the rabbinate, but I think in a public audience here, 
I'll pass. I'm not sure. Last question. Um, I was at a lecture. I think you were the speaker, but I'm not sure. Uh, when you have your eyes closed, you know. Um, where the discussion of, you know, um, I mean, IV intravaginal fertilization, blah, 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 that cloning was felt to be the, the product of cloning was not a son or a daughter, but a sister or a brother. So the, my question is, is, would there be a difference in the rules if you're, um, whether you're talking about United States rules or whether you're talking about Jewish rules, if the product of cloning is perceived as a brother or sister? I think the product of cloning is a child of the woman who gives birth to it. Uh, I don't think I've ever said anything to the contrary other than as a speculative thought process. Um, so I'm not 100% sure, but I'm fairly certain that a woman who gives birth to a child, she's the mother, that's the child, and there's no other dominant uh, Jewish law analysis. Uh, before I end, I just want to use this as an opportunity uh, to thank Professor Witte. He, he stands here as if he just organizes these events, um, but it's much more than that. The Law and Religion program, which he directs, is a reflection of his intellectual greatness. Um, it's a collection of diverse scholars all doing their own uh, weird thing, like me, um, uh, brought together by a conductor who conducts this magical symphony in which we each play our own musical instrument, deaf frequently to the instruments played by others, and <laughs> Professor Witte makes sure that everything sounds beautiful. Um, it's a remarkable activity. I've been watching him do this for a long time. I've said to myself over and over again that without him, um, nothing that I do at Emory would have accomplished anything. Um, he's a magician at um, uniting intellectual forces coherently, um, and there's magic in every word that he says, um, and it's a spectacular law and religion program. Um, I know that some of you are here uh, for me, um, but I urge you to use this as an opportunity to grab one of the flyers. Um, all of the speakers that follow me are, truth be told, markedly smarter than me and um, well worth going to hear. Um, and we shouldn't leave here without a round of applause for Professor John Whitty. So that was just a warm-up applause for a fabulous speaker this evening. And the magic word I want to say is thank you, Michael. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.